Welcome everybody to Mark Who 77. Woohoo! It's episode 9 of the 77 publications and Mark Who 42's uh, comic podcast where we talk to British comic creators who have some connection to the 77 publications. I'm your host, Mark Baumgarten. We've got Vicki Jakubowski and editor in chief of the 77 publications, Ben Cullis. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi, Vicki. Hi, Mark. Hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. We have a special show today. You can hear from the music playing in the background. Ooh, spooky. Uh, <laughs> we're having an early Halloween here on uh, Mark Hughes 77. We've got a very special show. Uh, we're going to be talking about This Comic is Haunted, Issue 3. Oh, boy, the first two were amazing. We're coming up on a third one. Ben, why don't you introduce our guests? Fantastic. So my partner's in crime at the 77 Publications, um, brother and sister duo. Uh, the eldest has to be mentioned first. The youngest <laughs> will obviously be very upset about that. So introducing Dave Healy, uh, who is the editor of uh, This Comic is Haunted and has written so many fantastic strips for the 77 over the last four or five years. And Joe Healy, who's the editor of Pandora. Um, and has also written several strips for inclusion in this comic is haunted. And if there weren't enough, uh, squeezing in another person in on the show, Ian Stopforth, our amazing discovery, who's been working alongside amazing writers and in some great publications over the last three or four years. And he'll be joining us as well. Oh, cool. We've had these guys on Mark Who 42's universe before, so we're glad we get to talk to them, seeing them for once. So well, we've seen them, but you haven't. So they're going to be on. So without further ado, let's introduce, let, I, well, let me already introduce them. Let's bring them on. <laughs> hey guys, and welcome to the show, guys. Hi, Hi folks. Hey. Hello. We haven't seen you in a while because we've had you on our show, uh, the Mark Who 42 show, and it's great to be able to talk to you and see you officially. Yeah, it's very shiny here. As opposed like to it. unofficially? Indeed. Well, unofficially, you know. Oh, anyway. Uh, so usually we start with the hardest question. I always ask the hardest question first so that everything else is easy. But today we're going to do a little something different. We're going to ask a different question. And this is to Dave. Where did Haunted come from? Where did this comic Haunted come from? Well, I mean, it's it's something I'd wanted to do for a long, long time. I'm a huge horror fan going back to when I was a little kid, um, sneaking downstairs when mum and my dad went to bed. And uh, I'd sit and watch old black and white horror movies, like, you know, with the sound turned down, hoping no one would get up. Uh, and obviously, when we got the opportunity to create the 77, myself, Ben and Steve initially, and then bringing up on Joe, um, it it was a case of um, we had gaps within the publishing schedule and, and Ben says, does anyone want to do anything? And I, I, Joe bought out Pandora and I says, well, you know, I really want to do a horror comic. Um, initially, I wanted to do, call it Haunted, but there was already a, a sort of like large scale magazine on the shelves in the, in the UK called that. So I thought I can't do that. So we came up with several other titles and it seemed like every title had been taken already. And then I settled on This Comic is Haunted because it had never appeared anywhere. And literally the day I announced it, people were coming up with uh, obscure comics that had been released in the 1950s and 60s. And then Des Skin, who's a sort of stalwart of uh, British publishing, he produced Warrior, um, Hammer, uh, the House of Hammer magazine. Uh, came up and goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We And then uh, we were going to do a Marvel UK comic called that and then produce the mock-up cover of that, which hadn't been <laughs> shown anywhere before. And it was then I was like, okay, right, I'm just going with this comic is haunted and hopefully we won't get sued. And, that, and that's basically it. Um, we were lucky enough to have a great deal of uh, friends and uh, colleagues who um, were interested in uh, producing something for it. And I was quite surprised by... But I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was quite surprised by how many people were actually interested in doing something horror because there's not been a huge amount of horror on the scene in British comics over the years, certainly not for 30 years or so. And, uh, yeah, it's been really rewarding, and obviously working with everyone and, and taking on a different slant, whereas I'm just a writer 
on the other comics, and that's quite nice and it's quite easy. Um, and then taking on the editorial ship of uh, this comic is haunted. That's that's brought its own problems, which I can now appreciate a bit more of what Ben and Joe went through because uh, it is a bit like cats trying to get all the people's working at the same time, and and then you have problems. Of, some some people have bad days, so you have to. Uh, Make people happy on other days. So it's yeah, it's it's been really rewarding, and I think I think it's um, it's te it's testament that we're on issue three now, and you know there's certainly going to be an issue four that uh, it's doing okay. Cool, uh, Joe. What does this comic is haunted mean to you? Um, it it means an awful lot because I'm I've got to work <laughs> with an artist, not my brother. But I get to work with an artist of the caliber that Ian Stopforth like brings to any publication, and I I can see him scoffing. <laughs> <laughs> but, Sorry. No, I just just the just to to actually uh, find somebody who can take these mental images that I create in my my own head, these little rolling little. Joe films that, and then just put them onto uh, paper with sometimes just like the the really barest of lines and just bring these characters to life. So yeah, that that's what it means to me. It's it's the ability to work with Ian. Okay. Ian, same question. I, I assume you're gonna mention Joe and go. Of gushing course on I am. It. <laughs> No, of course I am. I mean, I, th I think from my perspective, it's a case of. I can only work with what's been given to me, you know, as as as, as an artist. So um, it's got to be, it's got to be something that fires my imagination. And the only reason why, if, if Joe's happy with that, it's it's kind of a it's a dialogue because it's basically how strong the script is now, evocative it is for for me, you know. And, and again, everything that we we do with this, it, it touches on a lot of things that I grew up with, um, surroundings, imagery. You know, even war people were talking about, um, that type of thing. Um, Horden, it, it's all it all strikes a chord with the kind of things that I've been in, in contact with in my life, and it's it's quite, it's very easy to um, it to, to do these um, stories with Joe because the stories are so strong and they they, they do sort of fire the imagination. So it's a, it's a kind of um, it's a ditto back to Joe really why I get involved with it because I will get to work with Joe. Uh, Vicky, why don't you ask the next question about this comic is haunted? Oh, see how you are. Well, you know, I'm well, putting you on the spot because <laughs> I always do. I like. I know you just love to do that. Yeah. I don't know why I'm not prepared better. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm having too much fun listening to our guests, and then I forget that I'm supposed to be asking them questions too. So, um, uh, okay, let's see. Next question. Hmm. Well, okay. So this is haunted. I have very much enjoyed uh, the first two, um, the first two uh, editions. Um, I guess um, what can we expect in the third one, or is it too early to ask that? Should I not ask that yet? With, not I, I see all. Mark's face. No. Mark's going. Don't ask. Don't ask. No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I see, mean, we've we've literally just ask. we've literally just put the Kickstarter up for. Um, review mm -hmm. so hopefully that will be going through no problems at all uh, most of the comics already in which we're in a very fortunate Ooh. position a lot of a lot of kickstarters sort of tend to sort of tag the art after it's been produced mm. because the concern that well if it doesn't reach its target then we may have wasted a lot of money whereas we've always been under the position that if we can show that we have the product ready and waiting for people it, it gives them um more security in with the, with what they're spending because at the end of the day the customer are the, the most important people in this and if they're and if they're yeah. willing to put their money on the line so we should be prepared as well to um fulfill that um so yes yeah, so we've got a fantastic image of which you can see part of behind me um for the main cover by andrew richmond who's our art oh, editor nice. um we've got a variant cover by simon hall who um is a really fantastic artist who i'm desperate to try down tied down to a strip um, but at the moment he's only been doing posters and so on for us but he's absolutely fantastic so I'm really looking forward to working with him in the future um, and he's going to be doing a variant cover for, for Joe and Ian's strip which I always call the lodger and I get told off for it, it's not at all it's uh, a series of interconnected stories 
um, featuring one person. But that, oh, that, well, that, we that was actually going to be actually title. asking. Yeah, yeah. We're so going to ask that question later. We're, we're, we're going to get um, more into the larger later. Yeah, we've got um, so Stalwart of the 77, and the Sawyers <laughs> is uh, going to be popping by to do uh, Horror Tale that's written by myself, um, Ravenous, which. Um, to describe it, it'd be something like John John Wick meets vampires. Rather, it's Ooh. it's going to be more of the extreme Ooh. sort of horror. We wanted to. I, I think I, I'm I'm a huge fan of cerebral horror and adjacent horror and, and all kind of things that you know that the, the modern the modern film users sort of tends to like. But I'm also a big fan of schlocky '80s horror as well. <laughs> and uh, working with Andy, every, every piece of it, yeah, yeah, exactly. And Andy's sort of. It, always works on the extremes of everything anyway so he's off some of the work he's had coming in that he's just incredible we've got a couple of lovely little other strips as well um uh bounce of winter and um oh i've lost it joe what we what's alan strip oh but the, uh, drummer from, the drummer hell. from yeah. hell bounce of winter and drummer from hell taking a break this issue however we do have a poster of each in um nice. just to, just to give us a bit of um space to put in some of the other strips that we've had come in because we've got we're very fortunate because so many people are really interested in doing horror stuff for us we've got a huge amount of uh backlog of stuff that we need to publish that's and only, a great and only... problem to have though yeah, well, absolutely it's a, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful dilemma the biggest dilemma i have is balancing the actual stories that we've got waiting to yeah. make sure we've got a, the correct balance of black and white and color and sort of genres within the horror Era. We've got a fantastic story by um, Christopher Rodriguez with art by, by Lola Bonata, and it's definitely out there. I mean, she she drew a wonderful strip in Pandora issue one, um, but this is very much it's the closest thing I think the seventy sevens publications have produced that you would say might be manga. Um, it's Ooh. it's very out there and it's really cool and I'm really pleased with that and we've had that in since issue one and I've just had to get it in there so we finally got that in and we've got plenty of other stuff as well which I don't want to give away too much but yeah well, that it, sounds it's, fabulous. it's looking to be a strong, strong, strong issue I'm really happy with it so far well, I should ask the question that I know that I'm, I'm getting the telepathy from Mark <laughs> that what he really wanted me to ask was what our normal first question usually is. Oh, you want to ask it or do I want to ask it? Do you okay. want to ask it? No, 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 no. I'll go ahead. Ask it. You can ask the first question. The hardest Normally, question there is. The hardest question that there ever is. And in normally this is what he asks first. But he wanted to first get an idea of what This Is Haunted is. But yeah. now we're going to ask who is fill in the blank so who is dave healy tell us who you are and where you come from and how did you get to where you are now i think we should why are you doing that. That? <laughs> yeah, should i do just, joe I'm first just a, guy, just a guy from the center of the uk <laughs> um yeah i hor like horror and writing has been my passion for many many years i, did, I wrote a, an awful lot during the um the 90s and early 2000s online um particularly within the horror genre um and yeah i was a frustrated writer never got the breaks it's very yeah. difficult i mean it's, it's, you know when, you, when you're tying down a full-time job kids family and so on and mm -hmm. so forth it's very difficult to take that step uh, and i think we got really lucky when we created the 77 that we were able to produce something like that and now we're in a position where we're actually a publishing house however large but we're still a publishing house yep. uh, and we're now able to bring our projects forward and and actually concentrate on what we really want to do um and i think I th don't get me wrong i love i love writing sci-fi i love writing you know any kind of things but horror is my thing and i think i think when you're able to do what you really want to do that just shows even more so yeah so the basically that's it i'm uh i'm more than happy writing anything else as well but i'm certainly like really enjoying um the horror, horror genre and i'm sort of carrying forward with this and then we'll see where it goes but you know while it help, while it keeps selling coffees we'll uh i'll keep editing it there you, go. there you go so joe tell us where did joe come from and how did we get to here um uh, so the youngest of five uh the only girl as well so i'm um, like the huge age gaps between my brothers so you can imagine what that was like growing up. Yeah. I'm um, sorry. Uh, yeah. I have brothers too. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I had had parents who were huge readers. Um, 
really instilled a love of reading into us. Um, Mum used to buy pretty much every single comic in like the for local news agents every Saturday um, and just bring it back for us. And then we'd all take take it in turns who'd read what. And my dad used to read 2000 AD, but Battle was his favourite and Commando. So um, I grew up in a comic household and um, my mum absolutely loves like real hard sci-fi. Like she, she, she absolutely ruined Silo for me recently because we we just getting into it and then it turns out that I read the book and uh, started telling us like plot lines that we were about to come up and it was just, no like, God, but um. Yeah, it's just, um, I guess, being the youngest, uh, I lived in a sort of like, I lived in my imagination for a long time as a, as I was growing up. Um, I was always drawing. Um, I always wanted to be uh, somebody doing something creative. And then sort of the pandemic hit. And uh, here we are, a few few years later with this wonderful collection of diverse stories sort of under our belts I'll be quite honest I never ever imagined I'd have any involvement in comics I know that's that's probably going to rub salt into some people's you know wounds or you know but I yeah I just I just ended up here it's a literal rabbit hole <laughs> but um, I'm enjoying it, and I'm enjoying getting my stories out there. Well, I know I'm personally very glad that you're part of it because I love your stories. So, yeah. thank you. Me too. No. Ian, let's hear from you. Who is Ian? Stop. For yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I do have a, a kind of a tendency to waffle a little bit, so I'll try and keep this as as uh, concise as I possibly can. But um, no, I'm kind of um many parallels to Joe really I'm a kind of an well, I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm I, me I'm, I'm probably considerably old but I'm a 70s and 80s kid who kind of never really grew up nor wanted to I think I think for me I came through comics through a fascination of imagery if I'll be honest with you in terms of um, I've always liked the idea of I mean for me at school the ideal day for me at school in, in primary school and secondary school or juniors would be to draw uh, that was my sort of kind of refuge where I loved it. And I loved the idea of trying to make something from nothing, um, and especially if imagination was involved. So there's a massive part of make-believe that was, in, that was in my artwork, and I think it's always stayed there. But it took me a little bit of time to realise that that's okay, the old you get to be that. It hasn't got to be anything that's about, you know, big fine arts, existential principles. It can be, but it can be about just what you like to draw. Um, I kind of came into comics in the 80s when I kind of just chance of counted upon my friend's old brother's 2080s. Thought, what the hell is that? That's amazing. You know, how can someone like, I think it was Boland I saw first, and then how can he create these images and make them so believable? Um, and I was judged that I was hooked on, first of all, and then I kind of bought my own 2080s, wanting to sort of see what, what it was about, and... It was Ian Gibson, I think, was the first Dread story I read. And then it kind of springed from there, really. Um, got interested in the likes of Bill Sinkiewicz and David McKean in terms of how they were making images on comics that eventually were, were about something else. And then I think from there, that spawned an interest in paint. So a long time with your fine art. Never thought I would be um, considered at a level to do any kind of comic art at all. Um, didn't think I was of that type of that kind of skill set. Um, but I loved the fact that, um, you know, you can, if Joe sends me a, sends me the strip and I've got to sort of go, actually, what does that, you know, how can I turn that into a, into a real looking thing? That's an amazing challenge for me to do. And I love it. So, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Really, really lucky to be working with the 77 because they were the people who kind of took, you know, took a gamble with me really. And I've sort of been, learning ever since. I'm just really happy to be where I am. I'm kind of a, you know, somebody with nothing to prove but a lot to learn. I want to know what, I want to know what Ian's chat up line to Dave McKean's going to be because he's at like Oh! <laughs> I know, I know. I've been thinking about that, yeah. 
Yeah, it's is it, are you going to be? Are you going to be as? Are you going to be as nervous as meeting Brian Bolland? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I do. I listen. I'm just a big fan, you know. So uh, yeah, I think definitely. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I just I'll probably just go up and sort of giggle and give them the comics a sign and run away, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question is the other question is. Have you ever done small artwork? Or has all your artwork in, always been huge? Mm. I tried. You know, Ben, I tried for the first um, issue of Extinction 2040. Um, and I don't think it, it... I can do it. I think if I have to do it, I can do it. But I just feel comfortable working bigger because I feel I've got more freedom. But yeah, I've tried. I, I mean, I, the, the, the occasional thing is A3. Um, the occasional um, splash page can be A3 potentially. But I just enjoy it. I mean, A2 is small for me in terms of scale. Five foot's more my kind of preferred kind of, you know, stretch or surface to work on. Is that what Vicky's going to get in the post? <laughs> no, it's going to be mine. A2, and it's on its way, by the way, Vicky. I sent it off last week, so it should be I know. time soon. I'm waiting patiently. I'll track I showed the boys before. Yeah, Let, let's I, see I, the artwork. Have, yeah, let me show you the picture. So this is, oh, hold it. I can't do it with my backdrop. <laughs> okay, this is the picture that's coming. In, hey, I got to do this just right. I got to. I'll put, put it, it on the screen. Yeah. I'll put them on the yeah. screen. Yeah, yeah. This is the picture that's coming. In graciously painted my husband in in aliens, as Hicks, and it's an amazing <laughs> picture. I love it. I can't wait for it to come. I've been showing it to everyone. Everyone thinks it is absolutely amazing, and they're oh, all please. jealous. <laughs> and I can't wait for it to come. I, I, just, I, I love it when the, I get packages. I think it's one of the absolute USPs of our Kickstarters is that we have, first of all, that the comics have got such great writers and artists, in, and I'm sure Joe and Dave will back me up on that, but also that we can ask and they will deliver if, 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 if they've got the time and if they're doing it. We have artists who do analog, you know, hand-drawn, hand-painted work, and we have amazing rewards. So um, I don't I think will it's a Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I can put Dave quite fact, on the spot at the moment about the next Kickstarter, but if it's anything like all the Kickstarters that we've had, there will be artwork available. And yeah. Ian, I think I just want to say on behalf of Do uh, Dave and Joe, and obviously Vicky, who's commissioned something, just we are just such huge fans. So um, <laughs> thanks for thanks yeah, for absolutely. I was I was chatting with uh, Ian and Joe the other day because like we I have. 357 um, Facebook messenger groups with the various creators. And uh, I, as I said to Ian, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if this comic is haunted, goes to issue 100, he can be in every issue. It's not a problem at all. Getting quite I took my background now. off so I can yeah. show something. You'll, you'll amazing get more fed up of me than I'll get more fed up. Then I'll get fed up for you, don't Is we? there someone else you. in this chat, Vicky, who's art? Yes, there well, is. I have gotten some amazing pieces from you guys. One of the first pieces I got was this. Ooh, Joe. Oh, nice. I like that. Nice. This. Now, what's really funny is, so we adopted a, a rabbit many years ago. Um, it was actually, long story short, it was a neighborhood rabbit that the kid had no business having and uh we adopted it we had it for many years before it passed and some of you may know that i'm a slight disney nerd yeah and, i think we and, do. Yeah, <laughs> we might, might know that. and so when i told joe just make me a rabbit and she made me this i have had to hide it i haven't even framed it and put it up yet because i'm afraid there's a few family members that might steal it off my wall oh. <laughs> then i got these recently Oh, they, from they Joe. are so cool. And I just, I've got a frame that I'm going to put wow. them all into. And I think those might go at work because then nobody can take them. Although the people at work now like them. So, <laughs> and I got a signed manuscript from Joe. Oh, wow. Excellent. Oh, I, can I, you tell I'm a fan? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm blushing. I'm, yeah. That's, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's I just validation though. Thank you. I I love this Kickstarter program because I can go. Ooh, I want that, and I want that, and I want that. One from Can column A, one something? from column B. <laughs> yeah. We'll say to the viewers as well. Um, Vicky's one of our most stalwart. Um, back <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what else? And 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 
not not beside the point here, but what else arrived this week and, and maybe you won't be able to show us? <laughs> I got this. As a matter of fact, when, when the package arrived, I actually thought it was from Ian and I was so excited. But then I opened it and at first I was dis- disappointed because it was not from this Ian, but from the other Ian. Ah. But then I opened it and I wasn't so disappointed anymore. Oh, wow. Lifeboat. Ian Gibson. It's holy crud. That's that's a that's quite a size that as well, isn't it? Mate, yeah, we can it's... talk about this. This is a great segue. So, Mister this... Stockford, <laughs> the jeopardy of sending artwork. I had to spend a fortune on double width, double reinforced, double wall. But look, it came. See, here's the God. packaging. Yeah, yeah, it came all in one piece. I was shocked because usually you. our mailman just destroys everything. <laughs> I've been living on tenterhooks, honestly, the last few days, waiting for people to tell, come back to me saying, the artwork's arrived, okay. Imagine if someone had received a Gibson crumpled up into Ooh. a ball or something. Oh, you know, it was so, yeah. Yeah. so what did you use to do yours, Ian? Come on, tell me. Come on, you've sent it. <laughs> Say again. We can compare, we can prepare, we can compare geeky kind of cardboard, um, you know. <laughs> oh, I, How do you ship me? your mail? <laughs> whatever's around, I, I I tend to whatever I think I can rely on. Really, I'm trying to be, you know, um, use recyclable stuff as well a little bit. So I'm trying to be sensitive towards that. But I tend to work with whatever I can safely use. Really, um, well, so I'm, yeah. But I, in case you haven't noticed, I'm not the most practical sort of hands-on type person. <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> yeah, but your work can't be rolled, can it? Because usually it's either on board or it's multimedia, yeah. and the, and it's, it would yeah. all. It, it, it doesn't take it, being rolled, does it? No, it can't really be rolled, no. So especially if it, I mean, nearly all of my pages, in fact, I think most of them are all done, they're effectively collages, really. You know, a yeah. panel here, a panel because it's mixed media as well. So, um, you know, I tend, to, I tend to get a bit twitchy from doing, I don't know what it is, I tend to be wanting to switch deliberately with media, depending on what I want to try and convey. So, yeah, it tends to be heavy, collage really yet so and also the watercolor paper which is normally the base for what i use um is yeah it, it has to be sent flat yeah i was well, i was I... lucky enough to i was lucky enough to get the cover to um this comic is haunted issue one which ian did bless him and uh, i remember picking it up from you at uh, lawless um, oh yeah for yeah. last and i'd got it in a, i'd got it in an art folder on the way back uh, and i had to travel by train and the train was quite busy and no one was sitting by me I was, I was like a dog. I was like, get away. <laughs> well, I, I should just let you let you all into a secret. One of the pictures that I've got from the lodger that Ian painted is actually four pieces of A4 taped together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't realise until I got home. Oh, you noticed, like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> There's a story about that, actually. I used to use yeah. uh, I want to use A2. I used to be able to buy A1 canvas sheets, and for some reason over the years, they've not become available. So I used to have to use um, A3. But they went down to A3 in the end, and I, I was using that. You could buy rolls of it, I think. And I don't know what's happened. I think it's been, I don't know whether it's cost of living crisis or Ukraine or whatever, but I can't find any um, A3, never mind A2, A3 canvas paper at all. Um, and the canvas paper is easier for things like you know scan and stuff like that. So I can't use canvases. I wouldn't be able to scan it very well with the scanner I've got here. So um, yeah, that seems to be the way off. And yet, so when I went, I did the um, screen and school um, image in when I was on holiday actually in Canada, and that's two sheets of um, watercolor because I could not find anywhere an A one or A two watercolor sheet. And I was, Tom was with me at the time we were going to these shops to look for them. I was absolutely like a proper, I was absolutely so disappointed that nowhere I could get, I could get an, an A2 or A1 sheet of watercolour. Um, but I was making a big, I was making a big deal about it in the shop. Like, I can't believe it. I can't believe, it. you know, kind of a, almost hoping someone would hear me and, well, I certainly think rescue. that's something you can ask David, Dave McKean because, of course, he's used to working with large scale stuff as well. So he may yeah. well have that. Oh, there it's you also, go. There's, there's it's also worth, in there, yeah. It's also worth bearing in mind. Ian was on holiday in Canada and took his work with him and painted <laughs> over there. He glossed over that bit. He actually went to Canada and worked on the comic. What a guy. And he oh, was literally messaging me 
Can I have the next page? Can you do the next page? And I, I have bet you were popular with a family mate. <laughs> I just see some my dinner. We just sat down to watch something, and I'm I was sorry. like, oh, I've, got, "I've got to disappear." <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. Have we chatted on this show about before when um, I gave Ian a very short lift to his vehicle in uh, <laughs> in the lakes? No, I don't think so. so. Myself. Myself and Bully get bundled in the car. Ian, Ian, and 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 Ian's got bits and pieces and bags and boxes, and he then gets into his car and probably leaves all of his belongings <laughs> in my car and drives off to drives off to uh, Wigan or or, or uh, crew. Sorry, crew, mate. Really, yeah. yeah, we've only got a month now, uh, Ben. Till the next time I do it. <laughs> oh, I can't. Well, yeah, I only have my little car. And it's full of all your stuff. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to catch up with you, um, I think, in the end of September, isn't it? In about four and a half weeks' time. I can't time. wait, yeah. If it's yeah. anything like last year, yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't wait. Last year was brilliant, wasn't it? It's was funny as well. I laughed so much that weekend. <laughs> when did you guys, where did you guys meet, Ben? Where did, where did you uh, join the 77? What was the, uh, the, the way in, the door? Well, I, okay, so... Dave and I met. We'd worked together at um, sorting out um, the 77 2000 AD group um, since about 2016, 2017. Yeah. But we didn't meet until Lawless, I think, 2018, I think it was. Oh. Do you remember because that shot of me, you, Paul Trumbull, and Steve Bull in the t shirts? That's right, yeah. And then. Yeah, that's the best time, mate. So, Ian, you were number. Were you in issue three? Or not as early as that with the 77? I don't, I don't know, four or five, wasn't I? Yeah, four or five, wasn't it? Yeah. I need to check, actually. But yeah, we, quite... we generally only meet at conventions. Um, ah. With everyone all over the country, obviously, like, in most, 99% of us working full-time doing various things. Mm. It's, it's very difficult just meeting up. So when you have a big convention, it's great because you can get 10, 15 people who you're really close to online meeting even if it's just for a day it's just wonderful just yeah. to sort of catch up and chat because yeah. the only way i get to see you guys is on zoom unless uh someone flies me over to lawless next year that would be oh, well cool. there's a double hand there's right a here. double <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's do a fundraiser fundraiser yeah, oh, yeah a fundraiser wait, and i will be hosting here, the uh, panel that, really works. Wants to go to <laughs> that would be amazing <laughs> so yeah lawless is um it's great because we we now um, have a, a very prime spot. We and, and 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 we all generally get to go. And it's hard work though. It is hard work. It's two days of nonstop. So, uh, but you mix it together, don't you? A um, bit of and 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 so Joe and I. The last time Joe and I we saw each other was in London, wasn't it, Joe? Um, Olympia at the London Film Comic Con. Yeah, that was a that was a, a, beast, a day a day and a half. Uh, uh, been in the world's biggest conservatory uh, on Next one of the one of the big, world's biggest artists, Joe. Absolutely. So you know, we were sweltering from the heat because it was one of the hottest days of the year, and it was like the, one of the biggest glass roofs I've ever seen. And uh, we'd got Simon Bisley sat next to us. Might have shared a, a bit of a, a sneaky tipple that I, <laughs> I managed to smuggle in, but um, yeah, it was just it was unreal. And just meeting people who never heard of us, who, you know, I, what really did it for me, the first person I sold one of the comics to was a young woman. So she would have been in sort of like her late teens, I think, potentially at college. And it was just so heartening to, to actually see because my experience buying comics when I was about that age was very different. Um, so, yeah. I think everybody has those archetypal stories about comic book shops. Um, certainly, you know, The Simpsons. Uh, mm -hmm. I sort of mythologised that. But, uh, yeah, it really did used to exist. You'd walk in as a woman and, uh, you know, it'd be quiet and everybody'd be staring. But, um, yeah, it was just, just amazing. Uh, it was a pinch-me moment to think that just down... Like, literally, I could have chucked a comic book and it probably would have hit Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> <laughs> Albeit he'd Shut. been behind a screen, 
you know, um, yeah, Chuck Norris, they were there. We just <laughs> couldn't see them. It was like these huge partitions. Uh, but yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Saw uh, uh, Michael McIntyre walking through the atrium downstairs. That was that was quite funny um, because one of the the staff then later told us because we walked through and we said, oh, I'm "Sure, I've just seen Michael McIntyre," and they were like, "Yeah, he's always here. Oh, he's always here. He's always angling for stuff." But <laughs> um, he seemed to be quite you know enamoured walking around. But yeah, it was, but, it was a good time. That's, and, that, and that is one of the great things about conventions that people might not realise. Um, by the time issue four comes out of This Comic is Haunted, there'll have been five strips um, with artists that I have met at conventions who have submitted artwork yeah. and asked me to look at it. And I've, said, and I've took a chance on them and said, yeah, yeah, go for it. There's there's two people. I mean, Lola Bonato was first, first came along at... Uh, um, Thought Bubble a couple of three years ago. We've got um, James Fletcher, who literally racked up to Lawless year before last uh, and said, can you look at my stuff? I don't think it's very good. And uh, Ian nearly fell off his chair. And <laughs> there's a few of us getting upset going, no, 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 this isn't right. <laughs> He's too good. Uh, and and quite a few others as well. So I, I think it's wonderful to sort of bring talent forward yourself. You know, it's like people took a chance on us yeah. and now we're taking a chance on other people. And it, it, it's really heartening to see that happen. And and I, I look forward to them doing the same thing going forward themselves, maybe producing their own comics one day. And that, that'd be wonderful. Uh, this is for you, Dave. Um, and it's really a simple question. Hopefully maybe not. Um, with the, su the success of the first two issues of This Comic is Hunted, because they were really well received from what I understand, and they were really good. Um, how did you, uh, were you, did you feel up to the challenge to edit issue three? D do you have any, uh, in hindsight, things you could have done better that you did this time? Um, not particularly. I, I think I might have took my foot off the gas a little bit. I might have got a bit too cocky with how uh, well issue one and two are done. Um, but even so, it's all coming together well anyway. Um, so I, I might need to be a little more, more, bit more proactive on issue four. But yeah, it, it, I don't know how Ben feels, but when you've got such great talent and you know, and a lot of it is if you can get the pagination for future issues right, so you know who's going to be coming in when, as long as you're in touch with those people and you keep saying, look, this is what this is when we need you, and so on and so forth. You do get some people, like for example, I'm paginated till issue, at the end of issue five. So someone knows they're in issue five. I may get lots of messages off them saying, "Can I come in an earlier issue?" And you have to kind of say, "I'm really sorry, we're full, but you are in issue five. Um, so if you have that pagination right, and you you know what's coming, the only downside is when someone comes along with something that's so amazing that you kind of have to move it forward which has happened um and which has made the comic slightly bigger at times i think we went from 36 pages to 40 in issue two and with 40 in issue three simply because there's that much great talent out there i can't it's hard to complain when there's a, a there's a surfeit of talent you know i mean for so many years within the british comic scene there was a sort of there was a, a, a real um, deficit of talent so it's um yeah i think i think i think we're okay uh, and as long as i can keep up the pagination and sort of keep in touch with those people and and when we do lose artists because it does happen um some some artists say oh 2000 ad is calling i'm really sorry i can't work with you anymore i'm really happy it, it is a sort of stick in the wheel like you know and it is <laughs> difficult but at the end of the day, we're here to sort of pr promote everyone. So when people move away, you just have to look at, well, okay, who's got a similar style to them? I'll bring those in. And every time it's worked. So, yeah, we're quite fortunate, I think. And like, and a lot of people are committed to this, the project as well, like Ian. He, he's fantastic. Like You know, he, he's really involved in it. I know I'll be all right with Jo because she's my sister and I'll just make her do it. And, and a, lot of, a lot of the guys, uh, you know, and a lot of the guys are really interested. And we get into the stage now where the, the more popular it gets, the more of the industry pros are getting interested now, which is what happened with the 77. So um, John Smith, who wrote Tyranny Rex, Indigo Prime, 
um, some brilliant Road Trooper stuff. Uh, the New Statesman, which is one of my all-time favourite comic books, he's working on a strip for us. Um, so it, it's it's nice. Uh, you get a good balance then of uh, seasoned professionals and newer talents. And I, th I think it helps each other. It's a little bit of competition. It's worth giving some background, Dave, that um, we don't use contracts, do we? So people aren't contracted to us. No, to not at all. If someone wants to go, good luck to them, you know. We're more than happy. Um, we're just grateful for whatever anyone can do for us because because we don't make any money out of it ourselves. We do rely on a lot of goodwill and a lot of goodwill within the Kickstarter itself by people doing sort of kindly doing sketches and so on and so forth for us, offering us the odd page here and there we can sell. Um, so yeah, would would that we could we were a massive conglomeration where we could just pump out stuff left right and center we're not we, we we're niche but we are we have got a um a following and and they're very loyal to us and i think we're very loyal to them as well i, th I think that helps well it's it's like this i i work full time and i in fact coming on to this call tonight i i was expecting to work till seven tonight um i work full time so i can actually um sort of support the comic as it as it were so um we really are doing this really for the love of it and that's no cliche it, it isn't for any sort of um industry sort of like recognition not for me anyway um because like like i said i fell down a rabbit hole with comics it was just like oh crikey i've got to write a script uh you know um and i did it but yeah certainly uh we're all holding down and this is where the little violin comes out um, <laughs> in, the, in the main part we're all holding down full-time jobs and this is a uh another full-time job in our sort of like time away from the one that you know the other one but um yeah just wanted to stress that one <laughs> The hobby that's not really a hobby. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Ian, mm -hmm. um, I, we talked about this on the radio show, and, and I also talked uh, to another certain person on the radio show, Paul Goodenough. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know you do Extinction 2040 with him, yeah. and you were one of the artists in the plethora of artists in rewriting Extinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where did you, uh, how did you guys meet and where did you uh, work together? How did you work together on Extinction 2040? Well, Ben effectively introduced me to Paul very early on, but basically within, within the first call I spoke to Ben, Ben asked to speak to him and he said I've, I've, I've matched with someone. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Um, ben did reassure me saying Paul was a nice guy and he really is. He's a smashing fella. Um, so we worked together uh, very closely um, with Extinction 2040. And the, the three or four pieces I did for him with the Extinction are the most, the most important comic book on earth. Yeah. That particular period was a, was like, say, say, three or four days of each one collectively was about, say, you know, three or four days of quite close work. And um, again, Paul, like, 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 um, 77 um is has been really really good for me in terms of um just like the way you know i've learned a lot from the comments of the writers and, and ben um in the 77 i've learned a lot from paul um so paul is is, is often paul's got this uh, paul has a very specific idea what he wants so um i'll send drafts and we'll we'll talk about the drafts an awful lot so um, working with him, um, I forgot the question. What was it again? <laughs> I've just sailed off. Um, no, I'll, I'll carry on waffling and just tell him to shut up. Go ahead, waffle, waffle, waffle. French toast, French toast. You were answering the question. Paul, you were fine. You're fine. Paul's, um, Paul, Paul's been yeah, he's been he's been fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I've been very very lucky uh, working with Paul and everybody else on this call. Really, um, just um, very very encouraging. Um, and, and very and, and constructively honest as well at the time, which I really value as well. Um, so that's been that's been great. Yeah. So we we worked on Extinction Twenty Forty. 
and we all look at we just we, we finished about a few months back a, a prequel for that for the annual which was a lot of fun because that took the the story of of of, of azure you know and, and that in a very very different direction um and, and consequently forced me to sort of work in a very different way, sort of pictorially speaking. Imagery was very different. Lots of references and sort of homages to superhero imagery um, based on the mindset of a, of, a, of, a, of a poor kid who was obsessed with Azure. Um, so that was that was a lot of fun. And just playing around with, playing around with them, storytelling and... Um, the, the formatting of pages is, I think has been a big help for me going forward. So for instance, in this strip now, I was thinking last, I was just sent a brief, a, 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 a draft over last night. And I was thinking about more about how am I telling this story properly? So it's all clear. Um, rather than just, you know, when you're doing comic art, it's a funny one because you've got to tell them the story is the most important thing. Um, the most important thing. And I think the problem is someone like myself, who's obsessed with wanting to get something to look right can get lost in that a little bit so um yeah i'll uh, i'll i'll just tail off now okay uh <laughs> one more question uh, follow up on that one we've been asking everyone who's worked with paul good enough on rewriting extinction and we're gonna ask you now are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution that's a really good question i think it's a bit of both um so i you know i could do more um in terms of making a better environment. Um, I do, I, what I find really inspiring about Paul is that um, he lives his life with that kind of idea of changing things and making his own surroundings, engineering things so he's doing all he can. Um, and when, you, when I spent the weekend with Paul in, in Lawless, and when you see that, when you're kind of present in that, and you think you're doing okay, you think, well, and, and in no preachy way whatsoever by Paul, by the way, he doesn't ever, ever say, well, this is what you should be doing, ever. But when you see someone walking around picking up litter um, because it's important to him, that's a big deal. You know, you think, I need to sort of um, step up more. So I think it's, it's a little bit of both. I mean, I was really, really pleased to have been part of that, um, Grand Extinction and um, the most important comic book on Earth. Yeah. Um, and it does make you think. I've, 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 I've joined local kind of, you know, groups just online about content, about um, the environments and, and transitions and things. I've done a lot of that, um, but I need to be more proactive. I'll be honest. Yeah. I have a question for our guests, just because I'm, I'm a, you know, I've got the day job and then I've got my creative side and, and, you know, sometimes it feels like they're a little bit in conflict and sometimes I try and marry the two together. You know, do you ever feel that, um, I, I guess it's, it's that combination of, do you feel like the day job sometimes takes away from your ability to be creative or do you feel that um, maybe your desire to be creative takes away from your your responsibilities to do your day job that pays for you to be creative? I know it's it's a circular <laughs> question, but you, you know, kind of, we'll start with Ian since we left off with you. I mean, how do you how do you resolve that circular problem? It's always at the forefront of my mind. Now. So, um, I mean, I. I try to do as much as I can in my day job and do the right thing as much as I possibly can as, as, as a responsibility to, you know, I, I want my kids to understand that you commit to something, you do it, you mm -hmm. know, and you don't kind of, you don't kind of um, shy away from difficulty and stuff like that. Um, so in that regard, I, I do it in that way. I also try, to, I try to see them as much as possible as sort of interlinked. So, you know, the day job funds my passion yeah. you know in terms of um art and, and and working in this environment which you know i wish i'd i wish this opportunity had sort of become apparent as an option you know you know 20 30 years ago i didn't think i thought i was going to be a solitary fine artist and suddenly i'm working with people and realize this is the environment i need to be in so the work funds that lifestyle as far as i'm concerned as well so i i, I i'm able to sort of you know um paint what I want when I want and not feel inhibited in terms of how much is that going to cost because the, the, the job funds that. And I try to see the job as an enabler 
if I ever feel, which is frequent, I'll be honest with you, that I don't get enough hours to paint. I think, well, yeah. you know, if even if I was a full-time professional artist, um, there will be things I'd have to do that don't involve the direct activity, you know, to be things I've been having to do. Um, so I yeah. think yeah. that's the, uh, yeah, it's a bit, I try, I try to see it as a bit of yin and yang, um, but I'll be lying if I said, you know, one of my things would be, my one of my dreams would be to do this full-time, not because I want to make, a, you know, a lot of money out of it or, um you know, any kinds of, um, you know, notions of fame. It's not like that. It's just the fact that my, my dreams would be to be respected for what I did and to be do it full time only because I love to do it. Yeah. Joe, you touched on, on that a little bit too. How, how do you kind of find a way to balance that out? Um, how do I answer that one? Um, Hopefully you well, do it better than I do. <laughs> if I don't work, I can't do comic. Yeah. If I don't work, I can't draw because I I obviously wouldn't be able to afford uh, the materials. However, I wish I had more time to be creative because mm -hmm. I, yeah. I love sculpture. And I can't Ooh. do the sculpture that I like. So I do a lot of um, textile sculpture um, because I I lose myself and can spend yeah. the whole day doing it. But obviously, I can't do that if I've got to get up and uh, got to earn, earn my rabbits <laughs> and carrots. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I, I think we've, uh, like, what's happening in the world at the moment i've got to future proof my life yeah. so i have got to to work and i've got to take on responsibilities i mean i do you know i just laid down three and a half grand on a wheelchair the other day for my mum and that that bloody wheelchair has cost as much as my car yeah. and oh. i've got i've got work to pay for that you know there's i don't you know get support or anything so um, those no. those are the kind of things that are forcing me to work. Comic is an escapism, if I'm quite honest. Yeah. Um, at present, I must say my love is this story that I've been developing with, with Ian's input, should I say? You know, it's not a case that I just send him a script. He's it's that constant dialogue. Um. So yeah, that has been a massive help. It, it, it's really like a, a, a mental well-being thing oh. to, to actually you know be able to get these stories out there and then see Ian paint them so well, even though I'm not the one putting the mark to the paper it, it's still it, it's like doing it second hand it's like by yes. doing it by proxy if that makes sense yes. so yeah it's uh I think I've answered that one. Yes. I think I've done an Ian. I've, I've, I've gone through. Get there. You, you, stayed, you, there stayed on course. you stayed on course. Ian went on the bypass. Oh, shush. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was waffling. He even admits it. Hey. Oh, were you hey. waffling or French toasting? I don't know. Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry. Mark, that was. Mark, Mark. Dad joke? Door. Too much? Um, okay. Oh, no, I'm going to nick that one, Mark. I like that one. You got it. <laughs> no, no, you can mind. have it. I don't want it. You can have it. Dave, <laughs> yeah. so so how do you balance the real world with your creative side? Uh, comics is my full-time job, and the job I go to during the day is just something to do. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's simple as that. I um. You just yeah. pretend to work for, for your job. Yeah, I, love, I, love, I love work, but, you know. <laughs> Comics is my thing. That this is the thing I want to do, uh, and yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing just funds it. Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, it's really weird because I know I know Ben will say the same, and, and Joe, Joe, probably to a degree, um, Joe shuts off a bit better than I do, but I'll get texts at three o'clock in the morning and <laughs> messages all the time, and I'm I'm one of these people, and I get told off all the time by my partner. I'm one of these people. If I have a text, I I have to respond to it immediately. Mm. Otherwise, it's sort of sitting in my head and I feel really bad about it. So um, I'm probably a bit too open with, with the comics <laughs> were uh, a bit too available. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. 
the end of the day, it's, I, f I figure I'm 50 now. Um, I've got X amount of years left at work. I've got X amount of years creating comics. I've got to make the most of both of it. And if it takes up all my time, Outside yeah, I've been life. like that with yeah. my my day job, and and Mark knows that. Um, yeah, I've kind of been pushing it. The last couple of years have been a little crazy. It's it's hard being in in the kind of position I'm in, and and I'm trying to balance it to have more of the enjoyment side and more of my creative side. And you know, my kids all grown up. Um, my nieces and nephews are all grown up, and I'm trying to enjoy life. And um, I'm actually taking my first day off in. And I'm trying to count how many months it's been. <laughs> um, my last day off was in February. Wow. That includes wow. weekends. Um, I mean, I'm I'm <clears throat> playing hooky. Well, I'm not playing hooky. I'm taking some time off, but it's OK. I'm going to be working till nine o'clock tonight. So. <laughs> so. It's not like I'm playing hooky, but, um, you know, I always find it interesting how people try and figure out how do they balance their life, their home, their creative sides, because very few of us are fortunate enough that their work is their creative side, is their, you know, how do you balance it all? There, There's a very small percentage of people that it all kind of fits into one nice little box. Most of us, like I think all six of us on this discussion, we're all trying to balance it all. Yeah. We, right. we, we have to work to be able to fund all the other things that we want to do. So um, I'm, I'm impressed you guys. I think you're all doing very well and you're surviving very well and you're putting out an amazing product. So keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I think that um, I'm in awe of people who have full time jobs and are roped in to contribute or to, to, to put creative things together. Um, I'm fortunate in that that's not something I'm having to do all the time now. Uh, officially, I'm on summer holiday at the moment because I'm in education. Um, but not everybody gets the same sort of periods of time off as well. Um, but I think looking forward, I think really, as Dave said, it's a question of is a question of desire as well. If you look at how much time you want to spend on something, it's a question of how much you feel you want to achieve. And, um, you know, Dave's got his title. Joe's got Pandora 2 will be coming in the new year. Ian's got new projects, I'm sure. Um, you know, um, I've taken on board the podcast with you guys, as well as running some Kickstarters for other people. We just had John Wagner's um, book. It would be printing this week. And then the Ian Gibson's project and stuff. So, there's a lot of balls in the air, but it can't be done without te a team. And as, as Ian said as well, he saw himself as an individual artist. I think really the, the, the beauty of it is realizing when you're with a bunch of people that work and it works for you and it works for them that you stick at it. And, you know, we don't always agree about everything all the time, but we know each other well enough and we trust each other well enough that, you know, people want to say something, they can say something and we'll, all work on a solution to any kind of situation or look at improving something or ask, you know, how can we be doing something slightly differently? And we've been, so I'd say Dave and I have been working together for close on for, Dave is close on for seven years now, mate. Scary. That is really scary. And we might, you know, people might yeah, say, really oh, what are you doing? We say to them, oh, we were admining um, a Facebook group. But during that time, it, 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 it had exponential growth and it's become quite an important thing for a lot of people and it brought together a lot of creatives together so I was only thinking about it today I was thinking you know I always come around to August and August is when actually the history of the 77 um, was sort of founded in that summer I was away one summer in France and but thinking back it was the three or four years prior to that so people wouldn't always know about what what leads up to something yeah an awful, an awful lot of groundwork was done before for years before in turn just in terms of um getting to know creators like the 2000 ad creators personally and picking their brains i mean even before we decided to do a comic as such we were we were talking with creators about how we could help them because a lot a lot of the creators um they're not young guys. We're not young guys. We're not young folks, <laughs> but they really aren't young guys. And a lot of them have been out the scene for 20 years or so. They've gone on and worked in 
shops and libraries and and they weren't aware of just how important they were to literally thousands of people mm. yeah. and uh, you know I, I know ben would say this with steve mcmanus he, he's massively touched by how much love he receives from the um from the people in the various groups because that wasn't something that when you're working on a project like the were at 2018 back in the 70s and 80s you're in the sen- you're in the eye of the storm you're not aware of what's going on outside you so much and yeah you might be selling lots of comics but so were other comics selling lots of comics and it's only looking back sometimes 20 30 40 years later that you realize that there's something you created that you might think there was not that important is one of the most important things in someone's lives mm-hmm. and if, and if and if we can be fortunate enough to sort of strike lightning in a bottle and have that happen to us, I mean, I, I don't know, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know that when someone comes up to you at a convention and says, I really like your work, could you sign this? It's it, it's incredibly humbling and, yeah, and wonderful. Um, it, it's I'm kind of still in the imposter syndrome stage, whereas I'm sure most other people are, but it's still wonderful. And, you know, and uh, that's why we do it. And that's why we carry on doing it. I mean, Obviously, if the comics weren't selling and people weren't liking it, we could just walk away from this and have an awful yeah. lot more family time. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> it is, we, you know, we we've got was a certain amount of popularity, and and we've got a. I think it's important that we continue with that to keep making people happy because that's you know, people make me happy. I don't see any point in not making other people happy if we mm-hmm. can. So it's good stuff. Yeah, well I think said, I'm, well I'm, I might have said it on previous um radio shows with you mark okay but one of the the things about the 77 and the people sort of behind it the creators i know that's apparently a contentious word creators but the artists the writers the people who are uh, involved in producing the comics but one of the standout things for me was during 2020 and into 2021 how, because everything went online, um, we formed a community and people were getting in touch with one another. And that's why when we do go to conventions like Lawless, we we can be sat in the bar, you know, just eat. I always remember that one, just eating my tea, um, having me a little bit of chicken and like readers coming along and saying, oh, can we come and sit with you? And it's like, yeah. Why do you want to sit with me? You know, <laughs> nothing special. You don't but... realize that you've already started influencing yeah. the new group. Uh, but absolutely. But it was just so uh, heartwarming. And we were having um, gathering socials. Okay, albeit through Zoom. Um, at, you know, in the December of 2020 and into the new year. And it was that idea that, you know, people couldn't mix still, you know, but we could mix online. And I think that that in itself was um, really instrumental in in sort of like spreading the word of the 77 and, and creating that core group of people who um, influence us, our, you know, our readers influence us always. I think Wasn't Dave... something, Joe, that Steve Bull um, said that, it's not just about creating the product, you create the market first. Yes, the, absolutely. We yeah. understood, although we didn't necessarily have an objective, and we knew we had something when we had thousands of people that we were talking to on a daily basis through social media, in different groups and things, but we knew also that we could speak with them about what we were doing. And it doesn't mean that we design by committee and only will respond to what people want and stuff, you know. Um, but it is it is it's that it's the hard work it's the hard yards that people don't appreciate in that you know it's not just about and it's hard enough as it is create curating a comic commissioning strips putting it all together but you also need to have a whole bunch of people that you can then tell it about you tell tell that you know tell about that 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 product so yeah i think we're reaping the rewards of that and we'd i think maybe we'd also love to go maybe to another level but I don't think that would be for validatory purposes. I just think, you know, 5,000 people like something, 50,000 people would also like the same thing. It's just, how do you get it out there? And I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna become discouraged if we don't move to that level. Um, because I think, as you said, Vicky, very kindly, 
you say you like the products and you think what we're doing yeah. is, is, is is quality stuff. And, you know, when there's people like Ian involved and such like and great writing team involved, you you know, yeah, we work towards that. So, uh, I, you, we were, I think uh, you kind of mentioned it with Dave a little earlier, but I know you and Ian are working on a comic in issue three or worked on a comic called The Screaming Skull. Yes. Is this the Lodger continuing? Is this what's going on? Is this yeah. the original story? Is this the Lodger? So the Lodger was a, a sort of single shot story. Um, I don't know whether I, I think I mentioned it on one of the radio shows that um, I so, sort of miscommunication between myself and Dave. Um, I wrote a six page all in one story. And it was going to be just like a one shot. Um, however, I wrote six pages and I only had four in the comic. So after an awful lot of like um, scribbling and rewriting, um, I managed to hand in four pages. I had this character who was going to come in as sort of like a paranormal pest control expert. And his name was a riff on Maurice Gross, who was uh, really famous in sort of like uh, sort of ghost books, paranormal activity books back in the day in the 70s. So he investigated the Enfield poltergeist and he believed that it, it really happened. So this expert was going to come in and sort of clear, clear Helston House of its, um, its lodger. Um, the only problem is, like I say, I had four pages, but Dave was like, I really like this character. I want to read more. You need to write more on this. So, um, so then the second part of the lodger came in. So you, you met two characters right at the end of the lodger in issue two, which is, uh, I can't remember his name now. Horace Moss. I wrote it and I couldn't remember. Um, so <laughs> Horace Moss and his grandson, Robbie, who work as these, like I say, they're, they, they're pest control experts and um, they cover anything and everything that could happen in the house. Perhaps sometimes it's uh, it's these uh, people who don't necessarily leave when they, they should have. Um, and so... The Screaming Skull um, is a, another, uh, it's a two-part story, but featuring Horace Moss and, and Robbie. But um, it's, it, I've got to say, it's really based on, um, well, it's based on a couple of things. Again, going back to um, ghost books like Lord Littleton's, uh, or Lord Lytton's ghost book, or um, there's... Another really famous, um, oh, I can't remember his name, uh, a, a really famous Irish uh, ghost author from, like, say, the 20s and the 30s. But there were always these true life ghost stories where there was a skull in a house, in a box. And if that box was disturbed or moved, then obviously, you know, all pandemonium would break loose all hell would break loose and this school would start screaming but I also grew up in a household that had my for example my father was a, a regimental sergeant major back in the day and uh, my brothers were also uh, sort of connected to the military so um, one of the things they always used to refer to their RSMs was as screaming skulls and i i'd had this idea that horace horace's next story would be going out to help somebody who was in, living in a hoarding situation um but he was being haunted by um somebody who was potentially close to him but that's where this whole screaming skull um idea came in so um, you'll see from the variant cover, there is a, 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 a nod to um, very famous Lord Kitchener poster and, 
and you get to see our ghost on the, the front page. So, you know, I've just put loads of spoilers in there. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I just, the idea of that, you know, when my brothers would mention the screaming skull, as in their RSMs walking across the parade ground, I just used to have these like really wacky mental images and um, very literal images. So um, I did used to think that they had somebody walking around with a literal skull for their face. It, my ideas come from all different places, like, you know, these dusty corners of the mind. So, um, but yeah, it. but to pass it on to Simon Hall and also Ian, I have to say, I had both images of the the ghost in this story come at I'd say within hours of each other and I couldn't believe how similar they were. It was I, I was I couldn't believe that Ian hadn't been talking to Simon or vice versa, sharing images beforehand. Um but they got it to a T exactly how I wanted it. So wow. I the the concept of the cover I I came up with and Ian's produced this wonderful image and uh but like I say we've we've Ian Ian's uh painted characters as well um I, you you're just in for a, a real treat it's going all out you know ghostly horror for this one <laughs> we're kind of starting to run out of time so let's get back to this comic is haunted three um Dave what uh, you started telling us what's in it go through uh what's going to be in it again without telling too much yes so basically we've got the two very two covers the main cover by andy richmond and the variant cover which joe's just mentioned by simon hall which is both beautiful we've got lou stringer's back with his one page short sharp shocks because I want Louie in every issue again, because I just think he's just wonderful. He's so funny. It's this, when I get the scripts coming, they're just a joy to read, even before the artwork comes in. Um, we've got, obviously, The Screaming Skull with Joe. We've got Ravenous uh, with art by Andy Sawyers. We've got um, quite a few one-shots in this issue, actually. We've got, um, um, I think it's called Mine by Christopher Rodriguez and Lola Bonata. We've got The Fisherman by Noel Hannon. Who's, I'm a big fan of his uh, writing and Damien Edwardson, who I've wanted to get in for a while. He's a great artist. Um, what else have we got? We've got uh, a, a Dan Pollard story called The Eye of God, which is with art by Gary Burley, and that's beautiful. And that's going to be, uh, I think, a three parter, but once again, recur recurring in the future. And that's going to be um, a tale of cosmic horror. Um, if you're into HP Lovecraft and stuff like that, you'll start to. Uh, you'll start to see some things coming into that that uh, look really interesting. So, yeah, so um, once again, a, a mix of colour and uh, black and white stories. Um, it was quite strange because the first issue, we only had the one black and white story in, and um, I was amazed at how many people said, no, no, we want more black and white. And we were like, okay. So we're at a situation now where we're about half and half, uh, and the tone works really well. I'm really happy with that. And, uh, you know, it gives just enough modern modernity to it and, and a harkening back to sort of you know classic black and white comics like the eeries and creepies and so on and uh we've got a wonderful back cover by uh age hughes um who can just do no wrong in my book that's yeah. going to be from the drummer from hell and uh yeah so there's plenty there's plenty to come yeah it sounds like it's a packed uh, issue uh for the kickstarter campaign when is it running when uh, give us the dates for it ben's the man for that Dead. Okay, so it's um, starting on the bank holiday Monday, the 28th of August. So that's, that's going to be a couple of days after this um, show goes out. And it's running. It's quite a short campaign because we still have uh, hopes that we can uh, basically, first thing is it's going to be out well before Halloween. That's a, a very important um, deadline for us. But we'd like it to be out before the autumn series of co comic conventions um and i believe we are going to run until the 16th of september okay so that's um a sunday evening 16. and dave what's the cover price on this one 6.95 there we go an absolute bargain yeah same same as issue one and two no inflation here 
All right. What kind of perks are you offering for the Kickstarter campaign? What is yes, what things? perks can Vicky get? Yeah, what can Vicky spend? Yes, what can Vicky get? Cash on there. It, yeah, I, I folks, would imagine there will be, be, imagine there will be some original art pages. I'm going to be uh, berating Joe to do some more amazing sketches for me as well. Mm. Um, Lou is always gracious and kind enough to do sketches for us. Um, yeah. I would imagine Andy Sawyers will probably do something for us as well because he's always a good egg like that. Yeah. Um, we also do oh, those signed. Um, uh, you guys are kind enough to send me the signed scripts as well, which we'll just yeah. bundle together and send on T-shirts as well. Yeah, we always um, have a T. We'll have a new T-shirt. Not quite sure what design we'll use yet, but uh, we'll pick something suitably horrific. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, there'll be pl- there'll be plenty for everyone. The ad the ad old the add-ons will be there. All right, Uh, Vicky. Final question from you. (laughs) Ah, other than this is haunted. What's the next project you're doing, Joe? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. Honest answer. (laughs) I have to check my schedule. Ian, what's your next project? I'm on a V story with Steve Ball. Um, so that's um, Department of Artifacts. So we've had a good conversation about that. Um, and also um, a second part of the Extinction 2040 with Paul Good enough which we chatted about. But that's probably going to be a bit further on. But the next thing for me after this is to go straight on to the V story with Steve. Dave, what are you doing next? Um, I've got a Division 77 story coming up in the annual. That's going to be with art by Age Hughes again, like he did in the last annual, which was lovely. That'll be fully painted. Um, Blazer 4, I'm going to be doing another Transylvanian terror tale. Um, This time, it won't be about vampires. We'll be meeting... uh, uh, Christopher Lee-style character will be meeting a certain creature... Uh, in the Arctic and battling against the evil Nazis. So yeah, in a short in a short story, and uh, yeah, and I'm I'm always working on other stories in my head and trying to get something together. I, I hope one day to produce a, a full big graphic novel, but that that's some way down the line yet. Sounds like fun. Yeah, keeps me busy. Ben, final question from you. Ben, how are you going to find the time to fulfil a thousand copies of? Um, lifeboat and the bogeyman. I don't know, says Ben. <laughs> <laughs> but it you pays can the do it. We have the you videos. can do it. You can do it. <laughs> now that's going to be good. Um, and and keep our fingers crossed that all of the expensive artwork for Ian Gibson stuff has landed across the world. And uh, Vicky, you say you enjoyed. Your, you came in good condition, so that's, that's came in that's fabulous, something. perfect condition. Not a single creased corner. Great. Excellent. I'll report that back to Steve, who will be well knowing. Um, what do we do? Uh, last point. Ha- I don't know. Housekeeping point? Paul? Yes, let's do housekeeping. Go ahead, Ben. Well, that means you're going to ask me the question about where we can get hold of 77 publications. Yeah, you, right? where can we? I mean, I know it's on the screen on the on the uh, bottom. I can't even point the right way. On the bottom corner there. Uh, but go ahead and say it out loud. Well, you can get all your 77 publications from the77comic.net. Um, or you can meet myself and any of the gang at dozens of the conventions that we do. Um, and, um, yeah, so basically get on the, the 77comic.net and we'll get we'll get bundles of the 77 out to you. We've got a special price with those at the moment. We've got Pandora, the first issue. Um, jo is doing the second issue in the new year. She's going to be talking about that in a minute, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, the so we've got issues one and two of of Haunted. We've got Blazer one, two, and three. And as Dave said, uh, Blazer's number four is has been commissioned and coming out in the new year. Um, and I'll be waiting eagerly for some artwork from Ian. Oh yes, repairs <laughs> artwork. Oops. <laughs> let me get and so my... is Vicky, and so yeah. is Vicky. So is Vicky. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let me do my housekeeping real quick. Uh, listen to Vicky and I on uh, Subspace Radio Network. We have a show called Mark Who 42's Universe. We cover science fiction in general. We always interview the 77 people like we're doing here. Uh, we also 
have a podcast. The Extended Podcast is available on most podcast platforms, including Pandora, Audible, yay, Amazon. Uh, you can find that. It's called The Mark Who 42's Universe Podcast. Um, okay. Uh, actually, Joe, we asked you what you talk about Pandora issue two because we, we you know, you kind of like, I don't know what to say, but yeah, go say something. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've been given the go ahead to go for January 2020. Just got checked 24. I was just about to say 2021. So that's when the last one came out. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So we're going ahead for January for the new year and this should then sort of um like it, it will fit in with the publishing schedule for the 77 publications because obviously we've had extraordinary circumstances this year um with the, the likes of lifeboat which is just amazing if you haven't backed it already then obviously john wagner's amazing bogeyman yeah. And uh, like I say, I'm very hopeful I can sort of bookend Dave, you know, with, with a Pandora. Maybe this comic is haunted. Maybe do that. So yeah. All right. Uh, let's let's have all our guests give final comments. Dave, anything you want to tell the people out there watching? Yeah, as always, just thank you. You know, you're the reason we do this, and your support means the world. Thank you so much. Ian? I'm going to ditto, Dave, the yeah, big thank you to people who support what we do. Um, it means everything to us, so yeah, thank you. And Joe? I, the same. Massive thank you, and uh, yeah, look after yourselves. All right, well, on behalf of myself, Mark Baumgarten, Vicky Jakubowski, and Ben Cullis, the editor-in-chief of the 77 Publications, I'd like to thank you all. Dave Healy, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Joe Healy, thank you for being here. And Ian Stopworth, a lovely to talk to you again. Thank you thank for coming. Thank you. Likewise. Thank I you. mean, it's lovely to have all, all the other two, too, but I just thought I'd switch up to what I was saying. <laughs> 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 I don't want them to feel offended. I meant it equally. It's an equal opportunity. <laughs> uh, so uh, until next time. And I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this quote up because I didn't say it last time. I'm gonna mess it up again. Banksy always likes to say, stay lucky. Bye, everyone. Thank you.